Uh, good morning. Um, our work session for 9.30 it has been extended and starting now at uh, 9.50 or thereabouts. Um, we're, I want to apologize to the assessor for that. We're in the Board of Supervisors Executive Conference Room. I'm Melody Lane. Any item on this agenda is open for discussion and we begin with the roll call. District 1. Crosby is still here. District 2. Supervisor English is present. District 3. Supervisor Judd is here. We have a complete board. Members of the public may also attend this meeting by Microsoft Teams computer or mobile app or by phone by calling 602-609-7513 or 888-680-6714. Conference ID 291-067-506-POUND. If you have trouble accessing this meeting remotely, call 520-432-9200 for direction. Work sessions are a time for the county staff to inform and discuss agenda items with the Board of Supervisors, and public comment will not be taken. Introductions, as always, in work sessions should be, before you begin to speak, tell us who you are for the, for the permanent record. And I will ask uh, Mr. Karwashka if you wish to start this off. Just to present that right. this is the budget work session with the assessor's office. So, so I will cool. that up. Good morning. Uh, Phil Eindecker, the county assessor. Uh, Madam Chair, board members, uh, I guess this is uh, just a time that I would like to maybe brief the board a little bit about the function impact and revenue generated by the assessor's office uh, for the benefit of the board. I have a brief PowerPoint uh, that I presented, and um, we go to page two. Basically, we're talking about this is standard boilerplate, our primary duties and functions of the assessor's office. <laughs> about 98% of everything the assessor's office does is statutorily mandated. So there's very little discretionary uh, budget issue involving what our budget entails. Uh, basically, everything, every single function we do basically is a mandate by statute. We generate the assessment role. We report that to over 85 different taxing jurisdictions on an annual basis, and, and that involves um, a detailed list of responsibilities, and we won't jump get into any details there. Page two basically will give a um, five-year valuation history to give you an idea of where we're at and where we've come from. Um, back in 2019, our full cash value was $8,568,000,000. Uh, uh, the 2023 Cochise County full cash value is $11,029,000,000. Uh, that's a pretty significant increase. Um, some of that is involved with increase in just market value. A lot of it is involved with increase in different valuations that have impacted the county. Uh, we've got a lot of growth going on, and we've got a lot of, um, you know, the real estate market is really strong, and, and this is showing in, in what our values reflect. Um, this is the full cash value. This is what we're mandated to reflect current market value. And the limited property value is what we levy against, which is a lesser number. But I always report the full cash value because that's the number by statute that we have to generate. And that's the number that we're measured by by the Arizona Department of Revenue. So we have to have values at market level and, and the Department of Revenue does a, a sales analysis every year, and we have to be in compliance with that, and they have the statutory authority to come in and change values if we're not where we should be. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, this year for 2024, our valuations have gone out. We had significant increases in values for 2024, that have gone out, and, and they range any, anywhere from 12 to 21% increases across the board in most properties, uh, 
residential properties, anything involving uh, buildings um, took a pretty significant increase. Uh, building costs, cost of materials, uh, and the real estate market all impacted that increase for 2024. So we don't, we do not have a, a completed number for 24. Obviously, we don't have centrally valued numbers, et cetera. But we do know that going into 2024, we're showing a pretty significant increase in values. Um, right now, we're in the appeal period. And as of yesterday, we've got about 100 appeals, which is really light. But most of our conversation with taxpayers, uh, they're not happy with the increase. But when we talk to them, they understand why the increase is there. And everybody's pretty much aware of what the real estate market is. And, and that's a reality that we have to deal with. Um, so at any point, that's, that's where we're at as far as evaluation history. Go to pay, this, the next page. This is our 2024 Arizona Department of Revenue sales report, which is the sales analysis report that the department uses to measure us by. Um, basically, the median ratio is, is what we're looking at countywide for vacant land. We're at a 78 percent ratio. Uh, the target is between 76 and 90, 91 percentage points, and we're at 78, which is within within the reasonable target. Uh, countywide for residents, residential properties, we're at 75 percent. Again, that's within the acceptable limit. Um, the county is broke down into, we've broken the county down into nine separate market areas. So each one of these market areas are measured and valued and stand on their own merit, um, and which is what we have to do to get a, an accurate market consideration for each area. The, uh, the valuation levels have our, our constant uh, part of our work uh, in the office simply because as values change, we have to track these values and we have to stay within that acceptable bracket. And, and we have to, when the market goes up, we have to reflect that increase. If the market goes down, we have to reflect that increase. So our tracking of the real estate market through this affidavit of property value is a critical aspect of setting values each year. And that's always a challenge because of staffing and because of, of uh, um, having enough, in many cases, enough data to make accurate determinations. And this is always a push and shove issue with the Arizona Department of Revenue because they're in Phoenix. They look at blank numbers. Um, they don't have a good handle on reality, <laughs> and and we are continually butting heads with them on that issue. So, um, you know, this last year was it was an exercise of, of uh, head butting, uh, considerable head butting. But our objective is to have good values in place, uh, and if we have to deal with their lack of knowledge, then we deal with that, but we still want to get good values in play. We're in the process of adjusting, uh, reappraising land in Cochise County, um, and this is a pretty significant task. We've, we've done half the county this year, this last year for 24, and we're, we're going to finish that up for 25, and, and that's a significant challenge. Um, <clears throat> largely because we have such a large county and because you have a lot of rural areas that are quite diverse. So we have to have adequate sales data in those areas to set good values. And, and that's, that's one of our um, challenges. So right now we're, we're good to go with 2024. We're working on 2025 values as we speak.
So we're always ahead of the curve. Quick there. question, is it Jim Page? Where is Sulphur Springs? Uh, you're in market area either six or eight. Eight is Sulphur Springs, the so valley. The Kansas settlement? Yeah, the, the valley. Uh, Wilcox comes down into part of Kansas settlement. Sulphur Springs Valley takes in. Uh, eight. Yeah, six and eight. Uh, Pierce Ash Creek is on the west side. So we kind of have a mixture in there. Uh, between so Ash Kansas Creek is over here, and Pierce is over here. Yeah. And it's sort of a mess. Sulphur Springs, 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 Springs Valley goes down, takes in Elfrida farther south. Oh, even south. Okay. Yes. Mr. Leindecker, I had a similar question or observation sure. about Hereford. Kind of like Sulphur Springs, it isn't like an incorporated area. So uh, what, what would Hereford be based on? For the most part, Hereford is in Market Area 3. Okay. There is a little edge that's in market area 2, Bisbee, but for the most part, that's the edge of the Mule Mountains there. But from about Stark Overpass on west is all in market area 1. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, market area 3. Okay, the next page, we're just wanting to talk a little bit about our 2025 assessment priorities. Um, again, as mentioned, complete our land reappraisal of the county. That's, that's a major uh, challenge that we're working on. Um, our number one goal is always identify and capture all new construction. And from the, from the budgetary standpoint, new construction is critical to the county function because we capture that new construction as part of that calculation that, that we uh, benefit from. We use Google a lot for that. We use the aerial imagery is huge. We use it a lot. Um, we rely on, number one, building permits from the county and from the cities. That is challenging. <laughs> Some of the cities are not on top of it, and we're trying to work with them, and um, that's not always successful. But our charge is to locate, identify, and value property, and a big part of our responsibility is locating it. And with a lot of construction going on, be it new construction, be it remodels, with no permitting, that's a challenge. And that's, that's a continual issue that we're using aerial imagery, we're using every type of intelligence that we can get our hands on, you know, to identify new construction, and we have our appraisers in the field, um, but quite honestly, the, the aerial imagery is, is pretty huge for us. So, now, more so in the rural areas, because in a lot of the rural areas where you don't maybe have ready access to properties, uh, gates are closed, gates are locked, you can't see maybe where the property, the homes or structures are. So the aerial imagery is huge at letting us find new construction and going and, and discovering this stuff. And um, How current is the imagery that you're using? Well, that's problematic. Uh, I was going to say, it isn't like today. <laughs> no, no. We're what? We're working on 220. It varies where you are in the county. 2019, oh. some of it. Uh, I mean, I used to see some as early as last month, oh. but all, it varies. And then but the rural the, area is yes. I lags. see that as I'm yeah. surveying my communities. Yeah, and they do the, the, the urban areas more yeah. faster, more updated than the rural areas, when the rural areas is where we need it. So uh, sometimes we're four or five years old on the rural areas. Um, but at least it's there. That's, a, that's something that we didn't have years ago. It, it is. It is. And, and we do find from time to time, you know, escaped improvements that we would never have found without it, which is, which is really important. The, the, the focus of discovery and finding uh, new construction, remodels that we don't have permits on is huge because that impacts, obviously, the fairness of the assessment process. You know, if, if you have a $100,000 remodel on a home and we don't have it, 
Many times we won't discover that until that property sells, and that may be five years after the remodel, and it sells for $300,000 and we have $150,000 value. That's going to run a flag for us to do a field check on that property. But many times we're, you know, three, four, five years behind, maybe even farther, because there was no permit on that remodel. So then that creates a problem because now we have a sales ratio that is out of sync. And that would lead us to believe that our values are, are low, drastically low, when in fact our values aren't low, it's we're escape, we've got escaped assessments that are creating that low ratio. So we have to screen those affidavits of value when they come through to stay on top of that. That's part of that uh, deal that we deal with the Department of Revenue is that they process all those sales affidavits and those ratios sale by sale. And when the oddballs come in, when you have a ratio of 30%, we don't know whether that's a, a bad value, whether that's an escaped assessment, whether, you know, we have, to, we have to discover that and find out what the deal is. So that's a big part of what we do is chasing down um, changes in property assessments that we have no record of. Uh, but, but it's critical that we do it because that impacts our sales ratio study. So identifying and capturing all new construction is priority one. Um, we have to defend our values in the appeal process, which is very critical because we have to maintain that credibility with the taxpayer that what we have is correct and accurate. And if it's not, we need to fix it. So that's, that's a, a big issue that we deal with. Um, we have some court cases. We have some litigation. And um, that's an ongoing issue throughout the year in dealing with these cases. Um, in most cases, they're not a problem. We've got a big case right now dealing with a, a group of ag properties that, that's going to take uh, quite a bit of time. But we have the Arizona uh, Attorney General's Office siding with us in that case because part of the challenge is our procedure that we used, which is a state department of revenue mandated procedure so they're challenging not they're challenging us but they're challenging the procedure therefore the attorney general's office is is involved in the case to assist the to represent the department of revenue so that's a help on our side of the fence um i think tom has a question uh it, it can wait or i can ask you <laughs> uh we saw legislation wanting to decrease business and ag property rates down to residential rates. So what I'm wondering is what happens with a combined residential and ag property or a combined residential and business property? How do you handle that? We, we handle any type of a mixture and use. We handle with what we call a split ratio. In other words, we, we split the, the legal classification based on how much of the property is used for a business, how much of it is used for residential, for example. So if you had a $150,000 home and you had a $150,000 business, you'd have half the value at, assessed as residential and half of it as commercial. So as those rates change, that process just mathematical function just changes. Now, the reality that the legislature has consistently been reducing assessment rates has undercut our, our tax assessment base significantly. In the last 30 years, to the tune of about 45% of our tax base has been cut away by reducing the assessment rate. It's huge. And that's an issue that even commercial assessment rates uh, were at 25%, and now they've been dropped down to 18 Now that they're in the process of dropping half a percentage point every year to get down to the 15%, and even further if, if that legislation goes through. The reality is that's just taking and shifting. It does two things. I mean, it drops your actual net assessed values but it also shifts the responsibility from the commercial property 
over to the other classes of property, the residential properties, et cetera. So it's a tax shift. And basically, this has been promoted. Uh, the big major promoter of this is ATRA, Arizona State Tax Research. Okay. And anybody that knows, they're the big dog in town. They represent most of the big corporate entities. And this is being pushed down. All the centrally valued properties, the mines, utilities, uh, they're in this class one category. So they're getting all this reduction in value. And it has to be made up by the other property owners. So it is a tax shift to the homeowners and to the other classes of property. And uh, there's a lot more homeowners than commercial property owners, but uh, this gets pushed through the legislature on a regular basis under the term of fairness. And every year they keep finding more people that shouldn't pay taxes at all. Yeah. yeah. I think you said over the last 25 years it has dropped 45%. Yeah, over the last 30, uh, 30, 30 or so years, okay. yes. Change that to now, to give you a big example, centrally valued properties years ago was assessment rate of 60%. And centrally valued properties actually are self-reported values on our system on an income basis. And it used to be 60% because they had special valuation methodology. Now, they have been able to swap that swap that around and say, well, they should be treated like every other commercial property and be valued at the, the class one assessment ratio. And that's what's happened. And now they're gradually reducing the class, all class ones down. So there's been a huge shift uh, on that tax liability. Um, but, but that's, that's the reality that we deal with. Now, from the standpoint of my office, that means the work we do impacts less on the net assessed value. So if I pick up, you know, if we pick up $500,000 of commercial property that used to be assessed at 25% ratio, now it's assessed at 18 or 17% ratio, our work now is actually benefiting the county less because it's generating less assessed value. So it means we have to work harder to get the same <laughs> amount, which means we're trying to stay on top of things to be fair and to generate that that tax base that's necessary. My my view has always been the best scenario is to broaden the tax base so so people the, the more taxpayers the fewer everybody the less everybody pays. So to broaden that tax base allows that rate to be spread over more people and more property value. When we have properties that are escaping assessment uh, or not valued correctly, you know, that unfairness is what we try to address and, and stay on top of. And, and that's, that's the challenge. You mentioning the unfairness, and, and I don't want to say it's unfair, but the legislature also doesn't help by, um, and they did this years and years ago, but allowing ag properties to do whatever they want, whenever they want, without permits. That's a difficult, that, it's got to be horrible for you guys, but it's it's an advantageous for a lot of my constituents, <laughs> but they build and then they have to just get caught up with eventually. And, so. and the ag properties, that's always been problematic as far as permitting, but they're easier, the ag properties in many ways are easier to identify on, on some of the structures in that because we're required to review those properties okay. more often. So um, so they kind of covered up, they covered themselves by having to review. Them. Yeah, there, there's a statutory responsibility for us to review ag properties once every four years, okay. which is intended to capture that. I will tell you up front right now, I don't have the staff to do that. I can't comply with that statute because I simply don't have the staff to do that, and which is... A lot, like a lot of the statutes in, in, that we're required to do, it's physically impossible to comply with all of those statutes right. because of manpower yeah. abilities. Um, we have to complete our commercial improvement conversion, which we're working on. 
which has basically been an ongoing issue of, of we've still got a few market areas that we're cleaning up on. I want to initiate a mobile home reappraisal procedure uh, this next year, and that we're not sure what that's going to look like, but basically the mobile home valuation process um, needs to be look at, looked at and how we're doing it because it's generating um, low market values, but that's something that, that we have to dig into, but that's one of the priorities that we're, we're going to look into this next year. Don't they have some kind of a schedule like cars do? Yes. Yeah, yeah so there's basically two ways. Worth less than less. Yeah, the, there's basically two ways. The system that we're using, which a lot of the state uh, uses, is it's like a mobile home system. It's based upon the manufacturer's list price, less depreciation, and the Department of Revenue is supposed to be adjusting that depreciation schedule to reflect market value. But the reality is that a 30-year-old double wide that was purchased 30 years ago for $50,000 is probably worth $50,000 right now, and it's on a depreciated schedule, a 30-year-old schedule at, you know. Well, if it's in Santan, you know, it's going up. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and if it's and, and if these mobile homes are taken care of, uh, they're established in permanent situation uh, fixed, uh, they can appreciate, you know, obviously, but but we're depreciating them, which in fact then causes that big inequity in valuation where uh, stick built homes are appreciating and and mobile homes are de depreciating, and um, they're not they're not being treated. Comparable. Well, when it was set up, though, the mobile homes were actually mobile. <laughs> right. And yeah. what you're calling now, the yeah, yeah. The, these these yeah. actually are on foundation. Yeah. Yeah. License plates on them. So. <laughs> and, and there's no getting around the fact that mobile homes are not equal to stick-built homes in a lot of ways. I don't, if you've ever had a mobile home and tried to replace anything, it's <laughs> <laughs> nothing fits. <laughs> nothing works. <laughs> I got a question about the ag property, sure. and probably might have been a year ago already that uh, we talked about the ag property rates going up. And I think that you were talking about you wanted to do something over a 50-year period, but the, the people that were in the ag business said that they didn't think it was a 50-year period that you were talking about. It was more like well, a lot less, and so they were aggravated about that. What? What we did was we did a complete reappraisal of all ag property for 2023. And that went into effect. We increased uh, grazing values, irrigated land values, values for orchards, pe uh, pecans, pistachios, uh, <laughs> grapes. We implemented all that for 2023. It was a very significant increase. The the issue was that with the limited property value, there were humongous increases in full cash value, but their, the limited value only reflected a 5% increase. And unless something changes in that property, it will be a 5% per year. So it would take, it will take, we ran them out 40 to 50 years in a lot of these properties before the limited value ever gets up to the full cash value where it's at right now. So we've set market value, full cash values by statute where they need to be, but because the values were so low and because that limited value, they're just going to creep up 5% each year and it's going to take forever to get there. Now, there was a challenge. Um, that's part of the issue that we're in court on this this uh, litigation is the issue of whether or not uh, the nuts and the trees and, and the vineyards are being valued according to agricultural statute. So that's what's going to have to be get, get sorted out in this, in this court case. Okay, so the notes that I just took say the complete reappraisal that you implemented accelerated or it, it per, was perceived as accelerating what could have been a 50 year period. Yeah, it's, it's, it's increased to current level. So we're at market, we're not at market value, we're at the, the valuation level using standard valuation methodology is where we should be right now. And we've increased those values to that level on the full cash value level but the limited property value level is still way low. 
depends on the limits. Yeah, the limited value is, is, is the tax liability value. Thank you. So the saga continues on that. <laughs> okay, if we could go to the next slide. Um, basically, this is talking about our positions that we have in play right now. My biggest concern in our budget process for this year that I want to present to you, the board, is the fact that we have significant operational issues right now with staffing. And by that, I mean that right now I am staffed on my appraisal positions. I'm at 47% staffing level. Um, 50% of my senior appraiser positions are vacant. Now, I have an appraiser three position that basically is relegated to dealing with litigation and really complex commercial. I have five appraiser two positions. Of those five appraiser two positions, I only have two of those positions filled. I lost two of those positions this last year. In retirement? Or the gums? Within the county. Over to highways. And this is a pattern. Right. I should have said like you. Letting you change. This is a pattern. Now, right now, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna break that pattern, but I'm I've got to cannibalize my vacant saving vacancy savings to bring my existing people up to where I can keep them. I can't afford to lose senior appraisers. And if they walk across the street for a higher salary, you know, that's stupid. I mean, it's hurting the county operation when I lose senior appraisers because we're talking about appraiser twos that are second level certified in the state of Arizona that has, what, four or five up to how many years did Gabe have? 14, 15. 14, 15 years experience that walk, walk out. Well, the thing is, you can't hire this off the street. We hire, we train, and we get the experience, and um, I, need, I need to hold on to these people. I've got right now three new appraisers that are top-notch and I'll do what I can to keep them. But, you know, the quality of your people make your operation. And quite honestly, what we do, I'm not going to say what we do is more important than any other county office, but what we do is not easy. We're dealing, I'm sure you as board members get those phone calls from irate taxpayers regarding issues that eventually end up in our lap. Now, we deal with that. That's our job. But my people have to be trained and knowledgeable on how to deal with it. And if there is a problem, fix it. If not, explain why we can't fix it. My people have to go to hearings, uh, have to defend values, and in some cases litigation. But you don't hire people off the street and train them to do this overnight. It takes a lot of experience. And it takes the right personality and the right aptitude to do that. I mean, we can't go in there like stormtroopers and make things work because that just doesn't work. Uh, I was going to let you uh, address this topic. How long till an appraiser pays for themselves? If you could, and, and, and then how long till a new hire appraiser pays for themselves? If, if they do, I assume that they do. We get appraisers two ways. We either hire them off the street for appraiser position or we hire them as a, an appraiser uh, uh, assessor technician, get them experience in the field, in, in the office, before we get them certified. They require a certain state certification, which is a, a, a five-week um, training session, either in Tucson or Phoenix under the Department of Revenue. It's spread out over a period of time. Uh, generally, they have certification training a year. So depending on when we hire a person, uh, we've got people right now that we've hired. We've had on for, what, two or three 
Well, it's since October. Since October, and they won't be certified till the end of the year. So, <laughs> getting them hired and certified <laughs> is is lengthy period, and this would be level one certification. Level two certification takes a minimum of three years to get them the experience and the certification levels to to make them productive. I would say it takes an appraiser at least two years of experience to get them really effective. Okay. Uh, would you say that they pay for themselves? The reason why I'm bringing this up because when I was at the city, they, they had one so-called economic development person after another. And if you're just going to use to use a round number, pay this person $100,000, and they have to make $100,000 and one cent before they have economically developed anything. So okay. that's kind of what I'm getting at. So let me, let me put it this way. To, to pay a $40,000 salary, and we're not talking big salaries here. This is part of our, our issue. But a $40,000 salary, if, if they pay, pick up 75 dollars $200,000 assessments at a commercial level, they paid for themselves. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. 75 a a $200,000 value pays for themselves. However, that's just for the county. But when you realize the county rate is only $2.67, what that benefits, we actually work for all the other 80, 85 taxing jurisdictions. So all that value that we pick up helps the school districts, the hospital districts, the cities, and, and uh, the fire districts. Everything that we do, we may pay for ourselves here, but we're impacting all of the other taxing jurisdictions. And, and therefore the taxpayers. That's right. That's right. Now. One of the things that my office is, is does that a lot of the county offices do not do is we're responsible for all the county, the incorporated areas as well as the unincorporated areas. Mm -hmm. If you went to a lot of the other county offices, they're just dealing with the unincorporated area. You know how many properties there are in the incorporated parts of the county okay. compared to the unincorporated? More. It's a huge, yeah. huge responsibility. So, so we have uh, a pretty big task to stay on top of that issue. Um, the the concept of getting the the salaries up to where they need, I would really. Uh, like to say that we need a credible market study for our appraiser positions uh, out of HR, and I'll tell you why. We've been a very straightforward operation when we when we designate our positions. We have an appraiser one, an appraiser two, and an appraiser three. When ACO does county comparisons, a lot of the counties go into special designations for their positions. Uh, our appraiser three does litigation, but you go into some of these other counties that they have litigation specialists or, or market analysts or different things with these bigger titles, they get paid more, but really they're doing fundamentally appraisal work, but they, they're not compared to our appraiser positions when they do these markets to they get lost in the, in the shuffle. And really, to, to be paid for what they do, you know, we cross-train our people. I have appraiser technicians, assessor technicians, that are they're basically, some of them uh, go through the initial certification training, not, not full level one certification training, but we send them through the schools. We get them uh, trained up. They're capable of dealing with a lot of technical issues in our office that ha they have to, to deal with the public. Uh, we have title technicians that are that are assessor technicians. They do all of the extensive title work and research. Uh, a lot of counties call them different things and don't call them necessary technicians. The county study that we were looking at actually puts some of the technicians in higher positions than our appraisers. And when you when you analyze that. Part of that is the reason we have low numbers on our appraisers, and that is what we need to do, uh, readdress and get a credible market study for our appraisers. And uh, 
We've requested more money in our in our payroll budget simply for that reason. We have to get we have to get these salaries to the point because it's it's counterproductive to not have good people in these positions and not be able to keep them in these positions because they're making they're making number one they're generating revenue for the county but number two they're generating fairness and equity in the assessment process which is actually bigger the bigger issue right. and and when we're losing assessed value because we don't have the manpower and we don't have the training to get this stuff picked up um, you know we're leaving fruit on the vine and and we need to address that Mr. Weindecker, did you say five years was a, an okay uh, rule of thumb to get a, an assessor up and running? Uh, for a level one appraiser, I would say between two and three years. For a level for a level two appraiser, yeah, four to five years to get them really, uh, you know, trained and versed in it. Thank you. Now, one other thing that I've in, in doing my review here. We have 36 full-time employees. I went into my file and pulled out my 2001 budget. 36 full-time employees. The last 22 years, we haven't changed in the number of full-time employees. I, I, the comment that I, I, I want to make you know, to you specifically, is the fact that when people have been in a position for a long time, there's more of a, um, I want to say, a, a fondness for the county, wanting to help with the budget, wanting to keep things as reasonable as possible, um, trying not to come up with big overblown ideas. And sometimes you fall far behind because of that, because the newcomer comes in and they start asking for the sky, and some of them get it because they've asked for it. And so um, and it's, it's a compliment to you that you have tried to make it work all this time and have made it work, but there's a point where it doesn't work anymore. That's right. And so at, it appears to me that we reached that probably uh, five or six years ago, but now the reality is, is you can't keep losing assessor two positions. Right. That's your that's your meat and potatoes. Yes. <laughs> so I I don't know if it takes a a, a study to get it done, but if that's what you're if that's what you're asking for, I think that that would. It's very easy to do. We've got we can come up with the numbers. It's it's just that we have to be competitive with other offices, other departments in the county, right. and we have to we have to get our people. You know, I we make a real concerted effort to get good, good people. I've got, and I don't know if it says anything about the type of work we do. I've got two retirees from the Department of Corrections, <laughs> ex Border Patrol officer. And a gal that, that has grown up in the valley that is real capable. We've got four new people that are really sharp people. They are really sharp. And you want to keep them. I want to keep them. Right. <laughs> you know, they are gangbusters, you know. But we have to get good people, and then we have to keep them. And we're asking them to do, um, you know, a difficult job. And it's not unreasonable to be to to give them a reasonable pay, and they can pay pay their way. And I mean, from a business model, it would be for a business not to. And if I may, uh, I don't think we need to do an outside market study because we have the knowledge that your department has, and al along with the right. HR, because and just to kind of explain the market study, right? From the HR perspective. They just look at the position title and position title and look at cross counties to come up with a number. And then, then we look at your expertise to say, well, you got to look at another position as well. Because here in Cochise County, 
our tech does X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So I think providing that expertise and that information to our HR department, then we can get a more accurate uh, market study. But and I think that's what we need to yes. to move forward. I don't think we need to spend money to hire an outside agency to do it because you you already know the information. You've already got the information ready. Yeah. Sectioned off as to what you know what he's trying to, to yeah. get across to. It's it's not complex. Right. We just yeah. need we just need the money. Yeah. yeah. And in did you, in that money you did make a suggestion two hundred. I turned the page right. But you made a suggestion. Does that include fully funding the thirty six positions? Because I know we weren't giving you that extra money when you didn't have those positions filled. But or or would that be something that we kind of work on gradually over the year? I don't think we cut out any positions for you. Well, I lost what did we two thousand eight we lost six positions six positions in two thousand eight. We were two thousand and eight. Yeah. And they just never added them in. So I know their yeah. budget We were at thirty six, we were as high as forty two. I believe that's what it was. And then when the big cut came, I just Got mm -hmm. chopped off. So, so, do, so, my question again: that two hundred thousand plus that you're asking for, would that fund any of the extra positions, or just bring you up to market? I think that would just bring us up. Okay. Yeah, that because that's something that yes, probably ought to be discussed a little more. And that's why I say if he could yeah. hire more people, it, 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 not, it, 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 it needs, needs to be a people. comprehensive view, so we right. cover all the bases. Yes. Okay. Okay, any other questions, comments? How long have you been with the county? As assessor? Uh, or was it count anything? Leave mm -hmm. either both. Since he was 16. 50 plus one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back when he was 16, he was working here. So. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? Good presentation, Phil. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If there's nothing else, then we're, again, we're behind the eight ball uh, for the next meeting, which was supposed to be with the town school superintendent. So this work session is adjourned.